Right, so I've been working on uh, another one of these XGA 5000 amplifiers and I've got this channel fixed so I figured I'd just film the teardown of how to get these channel strips out so I'm going to have to come to the edge of the bench and um, let me so It's modular on a single heat sink. Some wires to unplug there. They're a bit, they've got like mastic stuff on them. With someone, and this is the butchered one. <coughs> so, yeah, there's only two Molex connectors, and then there's just six screws, sorry, five screws at the bottom of the heat sink here, which have to come out. And yeah, they're not particularly tight. They just, it's quite nicely done actually, because I've had a years ago, I ended up with a load of cheap Skytech amplifiers. Very, very similar construction, but done in a far cheaper and quicker and less effective manner. So, yeah, there's five screws at the bottom, and it's basically just these two screws on the side of the heat sink. So let's come back down. Somewhere there. So yeah, just these two screws on the side here have to come out. It's very difficult, especially when working on something this size, to try and find a good camera angle. Ideally you want to be looking at it from my view, however, it's just not possible because I wouldn't be able to do a, a friggin' thing. It's a camera and tripod in the way. So, that just lifts out. Simple enough. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. So this is the amplifier board for one channel, it's its entirety, all amplification post uh, basic preamp stage takes part here. So we have four emitter resistors, these sit in the output, in the emitter of the output transistors, uh, they stop current hogging between the output transistors, they're also used by the protection circuitry. The protection circuits, I'm going to need something slightly smaller than an old pipe because they are quite small. So if you look just, where are they? So there's one there, that tiny little 2N5401 and that 2N5551 there, those little SOT23 they're the protection circuits, they measure the voltage uh, relative across these output resistors and if they've determined that, um, I've not sketched this, there's different ways of doing it, you can just do it purely on current, you can do it on current and voltage across the output transistor, which is generally how it's done because it's the power you try trying to limit in the output transistors rather than just sheer current and obviously if you're near the full rail voltage on the output swing then there's only a couple of volts across these output transistors. If there's only 10 volts across them they could be having 10 amps going for each one and only dissipating 100 watts and they're rated at 200 watts at 25 degrees de rating. So but it's 75 volts across them if just one amp uh, they've got 75 watts across them so you generally measure the current and the voltage across them and you're trying to limit peak power within them but it might just be you know having a quick look at it it doesn't seem to be anything more than a very basic setup uh, I've, yeah I've not got round to sketching them out yet I've just been too busy trying to fix the things rather than mess about reverse engineering I did do a very crude sketch of the uh, input stage of the amplifier so if I can get that in shot so basically 
these two, you notice I've not even put the input resistors or coupling caps or anything on. So you've got the two tiny SOT23 input transistors. They feed into the base of these. They've got a collector low resistor on them. These are running is a long tail pair. Uh, that's about 220 ohm or 270 ohm resistor. And standard uh, mirror, current mirror. So the collector of one has a resistor here that's just to drop the voltage between the two lowers the dissipation in the transistors. The collector and base are connected so that's a current mirror and then this is the actual bias network. I think the bias network is actually a PNP not an NPN transistor. But yeah it was a real crude sketch as I was just plodding through the circuit just so I had an idea of some voltages, uh, the voltages I wanted to measure. And then the uh, output of the bias network and between these two transistors here then goes off to the drivers and then off to the output transistors. It's a very basic crude sketch. It was just done quickly yesterday because the other channel of this I fixed was not behaving. It, it was biasing up and it was not having a large DC offset or anything but I was getting nothing out of it. And it turned out to be, so, and I still can't for the life of me figure out how they did it. It's going to be the other way round, upside down, but there are the 5K6 resistor there, and there's a 5K6 there, and those are in the collectors of the input transistors, and they were both open circuit. They have no signs of being burned on them, and if you go back to the schematic, the confusing thing is... So you've got a current source here for the input stage, so that goes to the positive rail. It's a 1K resistor and it's sat parallel via the transistor junction with red LED. Red LED uh, is going to have like about 1.8 volts across it to turn it on. So if you minus about 0.7 volts for the input transistor, because small signal transistors generally need a bit more bias to turn them on. You're left with 1.1 volts or so, 1.8 minus sort of 0.7, 1.1. So you've got 1.1 milliamps. Well, that's split between two transistors. So that's like 0.55 milliamps in each transistor. Now, these have all shortened everything as the amp had blown up previously. But if this shorts, these these weren't shorted, so I can understand if these had shorted, they'd like try to pull one rail to the other rail, whatever, whichever transistors had gone first. Fair dues, I could see these had burned out, but these are just fine. So there's been no feed from a shorted output transistor through the collector to the base and to these res resistors to burn them out. So the only current they've been able to get is through these transistors. So even if one of these was turned on, it would still only have one milliamp and one milliamp through a 5600 ohm resistor is like five is that 5.6 milliwatts let me let me do some maths hang on a minute so yeah it's 5.6 milliwatts uh, if we if we call it 1.1 it's like 6.8 milliwatts which isn't enough to fry these which is just yeah i can't i can't see the failure node I can't see, even if these had shorted to a positive rail, which they did do, the, the upper transistors, if these had shorted to the positive rail. Um, so although it would pull the collector, so, you know, if it's a shorted, you've only got a volt or two across the bias resist, uh, transistor. So it would pull the collector of these right up to the positive rail here. Um, all, all I can think of is that if the feedback transistors were trying to compensate if the voltage collector base was somehow exceeded and then it ended up with an avalanche breakdown in the transistor, that's the only logical thing, but these, these are rated it quite high, but all, uh, you know, they're like 180 volts or something, I think, off the top of my head. But all I can think of, maybe there was a reverse bias uh, if these had been pulled down to the negative rail and these were trying to pull them to the positive, if it was a reverse bias thing when these then open circuit, if these were still connected, shorted, or this resistor went open circuit, some of these went open circuit, some didn't. Um, 
but yeah, there's, there's got to have been some kind of weird breakdowns happened, like an overvoltage avalanche breakdown, reverse bias or something, because the current to break these could not have come through these transistors. Um, these seemed, whatever happened to these resistors, these survived it just fine. They're working perfectly. So, yeah, I don't know. I can't say for certain, but something, there was no visible signs of even being broken on them. Um, you know, normally you get like little burn marks in them. So yeah, that's these two here. So they're going to be suspect in this amp. Um, previous video I said about the bias circuit. Turns out I was wrong. It is adjustable by millivolts. It really, but yeah, the, the tracks which look like they're joined are joined. But there is actually another connection. You cannot see it. It was only the other day on the other amp when I pulled this pot out. I thought I've got to pull this pot out and measure it. Um, it's only a 300 ohm pot. It says on the board to put 3k somewhere. It's under, I think it's actually under the pot. Yeah, it says 3k, but it's only a 300 ohm pot. But uh, I will need to check, but I'm pretty sure my maths worked out on this. I think I've just drawn this circuit upside down. Uh, this would be in the up, but yeah. So if you do the maths, 0 0.6 volts. So let's put the pot in its minimum position. So there's 1k coming from the base to the emitter that'll be not point let's call it not point six five volts well if there was a 1k here that'll be another point six five two k that would be one point three two k two it's like um another point one three so it's about one point four volts or something across here and plus the point six five here so that's like two point one volts uh, which you've got one two three four forward bias to emitter junction so you need 2.4 volts to turn these on and yeah sure enough even at full bias um, there's only like a couple of hundred millivolts between the bases of transistors the output transistors are not ever biased on until they're loaded up and if you just miss the other way well the 300 ohms it adds an extra 300 ohms of resistance in here which then means you need it's 1300 ohms so the 0.6 volts is generated across 1,300 ohms, so the current across this resistor is even less, and the bias drops down to about 2 volts or something, 2.1, I haven't got my calculator on me, but yeah. So, in order to get a good bias on here, if this was dropped to say 470 ohms, then this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, about 5 times this value here, so you know, if you move this resistor to its smallest value you'd have 0.6 here and about 3 volts here so you could bias it like 3.6 volts would be very heavy bias but you'd then adjust it down with this potentiometer and this is configured in a manner so if this goes open circuit the connection to the emitter is lost and this transistor will just be biased fully on and there'll be no voltage generated across it at all apart from its saturation voltage so it is an adjustable circuit, but really, uh, if you wanted to, say, use one of these amps for a more hi-fi purposes, which you wouldn't want to do with the amount of fan noise and stuff in them and the basic circuit, but you'd, you'd need to reduce this resistor down, 470 would be way too low value. I'd, I'd start at like 820 ohms, um, or, or increase the value of this one to like 2700 at 2700 it'll be 2.7 times the voltage here so 0.65 plus 1.2 plus 1.8 to be would just about do it if you increase this to like uh, 2700 ohms and then tweak this you would get somewhere near the voltage you'd want but yeah when i say this only being 300 ohms it barely does anything at all but the reason they put 300 is because if 3000 it would do you'd just be able to turn the bias off more you wouldn't be able to turn it on more but anyway i'm waffling so other things that go on these boards are so driver transistors output transistors they'll all be dead i'll check them in a minute driver um driver output output dead bias transistor should survive because it's current limited You've got the adjustment, this just adjusts the DC offset at the output. Uh, so these 100 ohms generally blow. They, get, they like to go open circuit uh, because the driver's short. 
So once the outputs are blown open, if these, these resistors go open so the output's short, there's no rail fuses, these resistors take the brunt of the current until they all go open circuit. Sometimes maybe one of them will survive because if these two burn out first, there's no nowhere for the current to go anymore. But if they all burn out or one set burns out, then the shorted driver transistor is now trying to pull all the current against the other two shorts through these 100 ohm resistors. So they go open circuit. That causes these output because there's now a massive voltage across the burned out resistor. It then is seen by the protection transistors, so they go open circuit, I mean they go short circuit. That pulls because these drivers, as basically when these turn on they steal base current away from the driver transistors, but because the drivers are shortened and these are shorted, these diodes um, then short, and then you've got basically some small resistors, you need to look around, there's like the resistors up to the base of these transistors so these 220 ohms they like to go short circuit as well um, this 1k this is part of the protection circuit that goes and that one can as well these 3.3 ohm resistors to the bases of the driver transistors they short and so far that seems about the most everything else seems to have survived it so you've got that one in that one so R13 and R12 short circuit R19 and R18 go short circuit I've had R7 go short circuit as well I seem to believe you get R4 and R5 go short circuit then R25 R23 R22 and R24 go short circuit all these big ones go short circuit all the output transistors and drivers go short circuit and then Q, I can't quite see what it is, but yeah, this I think it's Q10, it says there, and Q15, it's slightly obscure, but there you go, short circuit. All of this here, uh, like I've said before, I'm fairly certain it's just to do with the fan controller. It doesn't seem to be actually hooked up into the amplifier. Um, so yeah, I think this is actually what's controlling the fan speed. Uh, these diodes here are catching diodes. They're basically if the protection circuit operates you can get a large inductive spike coming back and these just connect from the output to the rails but they're reverse biased so if say the output transistor shut down momentarily as the protection kicks in if there's a large voltage spike if it tries to exceed either rail these diodes will conduct and just clamp it they survive just fine they, they don't do anything apart from in that scenario so Yes, lots of short circuits. So let's just get the meter out. Lots of short circuits and lots of open circuits. So let's just get the meter out and see, shall we? Right, meter on the 2K setting. So let's see. So drive a transistor. So that actually seems okay. However, this is under very low voltage conditions and it will have took a hit when this thing's died. You can, so, so basically you're doing a diode check, so you go base to collector, 609 ohms, base to emitter, 615. Now generally a good sign that the transistor is actually dead but seems okay is if you do this check and the two values is exactly the same, you normally get sort of five, six ohms difference. If they're identical, it's a pretty good sign that although it appears to be okay, it's, it's actually knackered. But go collector to emitter. Yeah, it seems okay, but I would change it because you do all this work here and I can guarantee you if you apply power to this thing, it will not work. This will just start leaking massively. If you actually put this on the load, this thing will be no good. So yeah. So yeah, that's base to collector on the output transistor, short circuit, base to emitter, short circuit. So yeah, output transistors are shorted, that is going to be shorted. Shorted, shorted. Let's turn the board over, try the same again. So this is the PMPs, this is to the positive rail. So again, Showing okay, 
I would not leave that in. It's it's just a false economy. It's it's going to be shorted. It's going to be knackered. It, under under voltage, it's just going to leak. And you can see shorted output transistors again. Absolutely dead. So now let's see about. So on the SOT twenty threes, it goes base collector emitter. So. Which way around is this one? There we are. See that SOT23 on the protection circuit is shorted. It seems all right when you go base to collector. When you go base to emitter, just giving us a short circuit. Yeah, there we are. What about collector to emitter? Yeah, which we should be getting open circuit, but there are diodes and stuff in the circuit, so it could be skewing it. So we'll check this diode. That 1N4148 seems to have survived. So we'll check the transistor over here. Let's see that's shorted base to collector and base to emitter. So those two are dead. Check the 100 ohms here. Oh, that one's actually all right. That one's actually all right. Which is which is unusual. Again, it's one of those. It's a question of how much of a hit have they took. Are they going to break? If you got a bag of them, just change them. They'll have took a hit. If all the other ones are burning out, they'll have took a hit. It'd be foolish to not change them. So let's check. That one and four and four, it seems to be okay. This one isn't as extensively dead as some of the other ones have been. And then it's just a case of going around and start checking. So we'll start with these 5K6. So we'll have to up the range on the old meter. I've had this meter years. There was a bloke on eBay. Yeah, I just randomly typed this meter in on eBay. I got this off Maplin. It was like the first meter I brought myself. Mate gave me one many years ago, cheapy one. And this one was like special offer. It was it wouldn't have been a lot back then. I wasn't earning a lot of money. It would have been somewhere around 10 to 20 pounds, probably maybe 10. Really wouldn't have been a very expensive meter. Someone was selling one on eBay the other week, faulty, and they was asking like 100 quid or something daft for it. Yeah, you tell me. So R13, yeah, that's survived. If these ones are dead, they just go open circuit. So yeah, I don't think this, this one, I'm going to say that both channels blew. I'm going to say the ever channel took the majority of the brunt of the force and this one went shortly afterwards. I think they must have connected the channels together or something because both channels on one amp being dead is, is rare. And then it maybe blew the fuse or something. So this one doesn't seem to be as extensively dead. So the 5K6 is all right. We'll come back down to the 2K range. That 270 is okay. That 220 is okay. This one's going to be a nice easy fix. That 220 is okay. The 510. Check this 100R. Yeah, um, so we'll check these 1Ks. There you are. Is that just a meter or is that dead? Right, yeah, look. So I'm just basically getting a cap or a diode or something for a fraction of a second. See, if I do it that way on, that's in parallel with the 1N4148 diode. Somewhere along the line electrically or that transistor junction. So it's saying that's 530 ohms, but that's, that's just a semiconductor conducting somewhere. So if I go this way, look, I'm not getting a K, that's open circuit. So that resistor R4 is dead. Let's try R5. It's also dead. Yeah, so R4 and R5 are dead. And then, of course, all these base resistors, these three R3s, are most likely going to be dead. To be honest, I'm not a fan of base. They're called a base stopper. The idea is they're like a grid stopper in a valve amp, meant to stop os oscillation. Um, now, you put them in MOSFETs, you put like a 100 ohm one in. But I found on bipolar designs, it can actually cause oscillation because you create a time constant with the, capa gate capa the base capacitance and the resistor. 
So, you know, it doesn't always necessarily actually work. So, yeah, look, they're all open circuit. They've all, they're all dead. Uh, so, yeah, these, all of these ones around this, whatever is circuitry this end is, they seem to be just fine. So, I was going to say, I'm not getting any diode reading on that diode, but I'm on the wrong setting. You need to be on this setting because it generates the voltage to actually break over the semiconductor junction. So, yes, they're all dead and we can test. So this is the output rail, this one here. So you've got minus plus ground output rail. So I can just come to the emitter. Should be reading 0.3 ohms, basically. Now I'm just getting some charge up somewhere. So yeah, all of the emitter resistors have gone open circuit. So yeah, I'm only getting reading there because it's actually shorting through the supply rail. But yeah, if I go from emitter to emitter. Look. So yeah, so we've ended up with four emitter resistors, four base resistors, two small signal transistors, um, the diodes seem okay, drivers and output transistors, replace them all, even if these seem okay, just replace them, trust me on that. And what else was it? Oh, and these, what? yeah, these 1K resistors. So not bad, one, two, three, four, five, six little SMD resistors, four five watt ceramic resistors, two SOT23 transistors, two TO220 transistors, and two TO247 transistors. So, four of them. So yeah, you know, soldering iron out, because I've done a few of these now, this is literally gonna be, hopefully, as long as I've found all the faults, you're talking a few minutes to do the outputs, a few minutes to do them, and a few minutes to do those other components. Track to it, it should be back in the amp and running within an hour maximum, really, once you set to. Uh, it's just a mess, you've got all the white goo on here you've got to clean off. Um, you've got to unsolder this, because otherwise you pull it. You either unsolder this, or you have to pull it out of the heat sink. Uh, this is something, again, to do with this circuit. So, not a hard fix. Um, but like I say, this is going to be the third board of these I fixed now. So it's not that quick the first time you try and tackle them. But let's zoom in and have a look at the goodness. All the lovely goodness. So yeah, you can see nothing too hard. Actually, you zoomed in a bit more, you can see it now. So it's that transistor there. That one. It's, I'm trying to do that backwards off the camera screen. That transistor there. It's that resistor there. It's that resistor there, that 1K. Uh, it's these four big resistors here and here. And it's that resistor, that one, that one, that one, and that one. And change all them and the drivers and outputs. And she should be good to go. So, yeah, those ever resistors that go are these ones. So you, you've got to just check all of these, basically. Any number of these can go. But these ones were the ones that were causing me the headache in the last time when I put it all back together and it's still just wouldn't working right yeah eventually found it to be them two uh yeah and i'm going to change that one and that one because they'll have took a hit uh i might just change the one and four and four eights as well there because although again they're reading okay they probably took a hit so it's worth changing well, i'm not sure what this one's for i've not sketched it out enough you know, i shall have to look into it. i need to sit down and actually sketch these out at some point but Right then, I've got my soldering iron on. I've got the soldering irons on. I've got the desoldering 
primed and ready. So, this is an awesome tool. Uh, I first got this, I, I thought I'd waste my money because I, I just could not get to grips with it. I kept, it kept blocking up and all manner of stuff. It turns out I was just using it ever so slightly wrong. Um, there's, it takes a, a bit of a, takes a bit of a, uh, what's, more, what's the word I'm looking for? It takes a few attempts, let's just say, before you get to the uh, hang of it. So make sure you get the solder melted and so yeah the, the trick with it is not to have it too hot because the lead or the lead free solder can oxidize and end up blocking the nozzle up so you have a little it reminds me of a rimmer and lister's soup straws in red dwarf but yeah, so if it, I find every couple of joints, just give this a little push down. It won't have blocked, but you might have got the odd little bit which is just start clinging to the sides. So you just go in and give it a little push. And if it does block, only put this sort of halfway in, let it get hot, and then push it through the solder and just do that on the way out. But yeah, uh, when I first got it, it just constantly blocked up on me. So yeah, just bad, bad usage upon my half parts, even. Should probably take them big resistors out first because they're in the way. So, and again, just down the nozzle just to make sure. So there's a little bit of resistance there, but nothing major. Screw the the end off. Whichever transistor that is, hopefully, should just wiggle free without excessive force. That's one out. So let's take these big resistors out. Uh, transistors are in the way of the resistors, resistors are in the way of the transistors. What can you do? So your trick as well, really get the heat in the thing you try and melt the solder from so you don't end up pulling the solder through cold. This one's tricky because it, it's bent over. Well, let's get here we go. And melt. Yeah, so it's just a process of repetition electronics work. You just keep going and going and going and And you try and do that with solder brain and solder and it'll take you forever and a day because this is through plated. Um, yeah, I can remember a few years back trying to fix, put a new volume pot in just like a mini mixing desk and it was through plated. And I ended up having to drill the connections out because I could not solder wick them no matter what I tried. Um, and then when I got this thing, the ever free channels, some point later on when I had it, it took me minutes. See that one's not quite gone. I was talking to you. I'm not busy enough watching what I was doing there because the collector terminal, the collector is connected to the base of the body of the transistor and so it really sucks the heat out. You find when you're trying to solder it as well you need like a big powerful iron if you actually want the solder to wick through and down actually into through the through plating and down to the other side of the transistor so and this one's 80 watts got it from CPC on offer can't remember what it costs now but it wasn't expensive it wasn't dirt cheap but it wasn't expensive but it was worth worth every penny and like I say just with a little bit of I know you just want to, ideally you just want to go on and hit every solder connection all in one go, but, you know, just taking a few seconds saves you minutes of messing around with a blocked up desoldering nozzle. So I have this set on these big transistors, I set it for 380, I generally have it 370 on the smaller stuff, because I find, like I said, if you go too hot, 
you can end up with it sort of forming a skin inside as it oxidizes on the way up. Uh, yeah, it's just... These ones I can hit all in one go because there's so little solder on them. And these three here. Give it its poke. Yeah, all good. So that's all the driver transistors and output transistors out. So now let's hit the resistors. This is just a thermal switch. Where's my thing? So that's a thermal switch for the 105 degrees. It will basically disconnect the outputs. And that's the bias transistor. That's just fine. Uh, like I said, that, that's completely isolated from the faults and even if the faults all I'll do is generate a voltage across it it won't do a lot so now to hit these resistors Pushing it, all eight in one go. Well, eight joints. Yes. See, all of that, not one blockage, just like I say, a little bit of preventative tip cleaning. Really like 380, actually, that seemed to work quite well. So, they'll just wobble out, dead. When you're doing electronics as well, never try and force something because you'll just end up pulling tracks off the circuit boards or damaging uh, pads. If it's not moving, like this one, if you just look, sometimes you wobble it and you can see it's just the tiniest little bit of solder that will let go. But if it's a blob of solder, if you try and force it, the amount of stuff I've had in where people have tried to repair it and because they've not cleaned, say, the solder out the hole per properly to start with, as they've tried putting a new component in, they've just forced it and it's actually lifted the track and I've had it where they put a blob of solder on the component leg, yet there's no pad or track left, it's like bent up over here somewhere. You think, well, you've made it worse than what it was, at least before the bad component was connected, now you've got a new component not connected. So, yeah, caps especially, oh, I'll recap it, that'll fix it. All my years of fixing things, it's 95% not capacitors. Now people who fix old radios will tell you different to that and they'll tell you it's very often old capacitors but I fix amplifiers and stuff and that's generally transistors in amplifiers transistors and resistors very seldom capacitors um, if it's a very old amplifier fair dues it's if it's still working but just not working very well it's probably capacitors but not on modern ones right so some SMD stuff so I find you can buy a little hot air tool but then you end up heating up everything else around the thing you're trying to heat up and very expensive and I find if the thing you're taking out dead already then just go in do not try and force it because you'll just lift the pads you just keep heating the pads individually until you end up with so much heat in it that it comes off. Come on, you bugger, he says. There we go, just like that. So you can see I just shoved it, I don't know how well you could see that I was kind of looking here, but just basically shoved the soldering iron across the blob of solder on two of the pads. That's gone, disappeared, you'll never find that again. And yeah, just basically get it hot, get it real hot. So where's the other one? I mean, this is fun. This screen's so, where am I? There I am. Just there. So, same again. That one, isn't it? Yep. That looks so much bigger on the camera than what I've got to look at. So. 
Now I've got a cap in the way of this one, which is just dandy. But uh, yeah, big blob of solder. Keep it nice and hot. And that one come off a bit easier, didn't it? And just like that, that's one cap gone. Uh, not cap, um, transistor, that's the word I was looking for. Now did I say these 1Ks were open? I believe I did, didn't I? I'd best just check that before I unsolder them. But uh, I think, yeah, this 1K, it is indeed, and the other 1K, it is indeed. So we'll take them out. Um, it's the same process basically, so where is it, this one? Am I on the camera? Let's move you around so you... Yes. So yeah, just bloody get it on. I've got this set at about 30 watts, which is enough to solder quite a heavy transistor. So big blob of solder, job done. I need to find my desoldering tray because I'm flicking stuff all over my table. Uh, can I get to it? Come here, you. Better. That's better. So that's that one, and the other one is up here, which is not in frame. Let's, uh, where am I? Somewhere. Oh no, I'm going the wrong way. Here I am, just here. All right, lock you off. Uh, takes an awful lot longer when you're trying to film it. <laughs> so this one here is the other one we're taking out. Probably should have just done that first really, shouldn't I, with the... And... Just like that. Job done. You can get some solder where you can clean the board if you want, but to be honest, we're just cleaning the end of the soldering iron off and... Heating the solder up will pretty much get it to a dear to your eye and you've got a bit there to lay your new component down onto. So yeah, I believe that was it. Oh, I was going to take these big ones out. You can see it's the old... It's the old, do you mess with them? Do you uh, transistors? Yeah, but resistors and that lot. I mean, if it's still showing the correct value, then you're going to get everything inside. It's fine because if part of the track had burned away, it would have gone up in value. So I think I'm just going to leave them. They don't really look overly brown. I've got an eye loop somewhere. They don't look like they've gone overly brown or anything. Like they've gotten massively hot. And like I say, those transistors did technically read as not shorted. So. Oh, I've got those other little ones to do. I'll do all them other ones off camera, but to... So let's see if we can. Yeah, they don't look... overly browned or anything. Um, yeah, so basically it's just, it's just this. It's just more and more of this. So like I said, it's not the best camera work in the world. So... If you want to stand there and watch me, I'll I'll film you. I'll film it. It's just a slow, steady messing about. Like I say, I'm working at the wrong angle here because I'd normally have this pointing towards me. Uh, the airplane in the sky. We get proper ones, not like those uh, engine ones that fly over Shango's house and uh, radio, TV, phone nuts. You can see when you actually set to it how quick this really is. These are actually quicker to remove than um, through hole components because there's no no desoldering. But the trick is heat. Do not, don't try and just heat one end of it and then force it up because all you're going to do is lift the pads. There's sod all copper under that. It's it's heat is the key. And I think. Fairly certain that was 
all of them. I don't think we had any of these two twenties up here have gone, have they? No, and yeah, this one's not took as bad a hit. So I'm almost tempted, just out of curiosity, to put those driver transistors, I mean, they're measuring bang on 100, to put those driver transistors back in just to actually see if it works with them in or not. But it's a lot of faffing around for nothing then, really. And these 5K60, yeah, like I say, I think the Eberamp took the brunt of it and nearly finished the fuse off by the time this one decided to go. And then this one... Um, this one kind of started frying and then the mains fuse blew and luckily enough no one put another one in. Oh, 20k, gee I've got to stop trying to chest transistors with it on the 20k setting. Yeah, no, that's all good. Yeah, they're all, even the little input transistors. 7, 6. Oh, I'm only measuring 200 ohms. I don't know what was I touching. Oh, I was touching the, uh, I was touching the leg of the potentiometer. And that's why seven six four. Seven five five. Yeah, and finally this one. This is part of the current sink. And the red LED. Good. Yeah, I've not got enough voltage on here to make it light. So yeah, that's the amplifier all ready for its new parts. Unfortunately, I don't have any new parts for it today. But they'll be turning up at some point in this week. But yeah, that's all the dead bits off this board. Um, again, the fact those output transistors didn't short is going to save these diodes by the looks of it. Uh, again. Again, like I say, transistors, yeah, get very leaky. Diodes are generally open circuit or short circuit. And there isn't really any in between. And although the transistors had shorted, because those output, those driver transistors don't actually seem to have hard shorted, the fact these resistors are still intact. So these diodes feed to the base and then this is the resistor coming from the collector of the driver transistor for that. The fact these haven't shorted and these haven't shorted and these haven't shorted and these technically haven't shorted. Um, yeah, I think really the, the damage is just in the output here and the protection circuit. Everything else seems to have took the hit. And as far as I can see, looking at schematic, normally when you have protection circuits in, you current limit the amount of current that comes out of drivers but there's no pre-drivers on these they're actually stealing the current from this weird input stage setup so I don't think the protective transistors will last very long I think it's a bit of a flawed design um, but yeah anyway I've waffled on long enough this video's gone for ages so yeah that's a little half hour or so on my bench uh, as always thanks for watching and catch you next time